Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. So I got a question from one of my email subscriber, Lucas, who asks about room modes and the distribution, understanding room modes in more complex room shapes. It's a great question. It gives me a chance to riff on some of the concepts and also the context of room mode standing waves in treating home studios. So that's why I wanted to show this to you and talk to you about it. But before I do that, if you want to figure out what the room mode pattern in your studio actually looks like, more importantly, you want to work with it in order to get the best bass response in your studio, then I want you to check out my guide to the Bass Hunter technique, which you can download for free at the link in the description. This is a simple step-by-step -step process to analyze the room mode pattern in your studio using just one speaker and your ears and some music to figure out exactly how the bass changes across your room, but more importantly, in a very practical approach in order to figure out where to place your listening position in that pattern of room modes to get the best balance in your bass. This is kind of the biggest lever we can pull in order to get a proper low end at our listening position. It's all about placing your listening position in what I call the low end sweet spot. So this technique shows you how to find that low end sweet spot in your room. And the beauty of it is that it works in any room shape. This isn't just for your typical shoebox shaped room. This works in any room shape, no matter what it is. It's, in my opinion, the quickest and easiest way to really nail down where you need to locate, set up your listening position, and then obviously, consequently, also your desk and your speakers. So if you wanna figure that out, if you have problems in your studio with your low end, chances are you're not sitting in your low end sweet spot. So download my guide to the Bass Hunter technique for free at the link in the description and figure out where it is in your room. Make sure you're set up there and get rid of this issue of low end imbalance moving forward. So with that, let's get to this question by Lucas. And he says, I have two questions which I would love to know your answers to. We talk about standing waves assuming the walls of our room run flo from floor to ceiling or assuming we only have one side wall at one distance away from us. What if there is a half wall next to our listing position or what if, same situation, just the vertical version, directly on one or both sides of our listening position, there is a wall two meters away from us, which ends and then falls back to a wall four meters away from us. In general terms, I understand that because the room dimensions are changing, so will the room modes, and that the walls will introduce their own individual room modes given the distance from then to the opposite wall. My question is though, how do, if at all, these room modes interact or bleed into each other? If my ear is above the half wall, Am I only being exposed to the room mode of the walls in line with my ear, or am I also being exposed to the room mode of the half wall, even though my ear is above it? Another simi similar but slightly different question, if my ear is right at the point at which the wall next to me turns from two meters away to four meters away, how far do I need to be so that I'm only being exposed to one room mode and not two? It's a great question. Let me actually read through the second one as well and answer that one first because it affects what I'm gonna tell you for the first question. So question two, it's, it's true that it's very hard or possible without major work to stop bass from leaking out through the walls and disturbing our neighbors. Why then is it also true that our walls will reflect bass in turn and in turn create room modes? It seems like we get the short end of the stick twice. Is it just that our walls will reflect some bass and not all? Yeah, simple, simple answer is exact. that's exactly right. Yeah, so part of the energy that hits the wall will get reflected and part will pass through it. 
Yeah, and depending on how much energy passes through the wall and does not get reflected, depending on what that ratio is, the actual room at mode that gets built, that gets kind of uh, constructed, if you will, has more or less energy because obviously some of the energy escaped through the wall. But on top of that, the actual frequency might also change, right? So the the acoustic barrier might not sit at exactly the same spot where the visual kind of wall sits, right? Because there might be a phase change when the energy hits the wall. Or in other words, the energy that hits the wall, part of it might be delayed because of the interaction with this structure, right? So you get basically three effects, right? So you get part of the energy transmitting through the wall, and then as part of the energy that comes back and is reflected and actually builds the room mode, part of that, well, the, the, the amount of that affects the amplitude of that standing wave, and then the timing of that will affect the actual frequency at which this room mode gets built. That's what makes this whole thing so difficult to predict. Yeah? You need to have a really deep understanding of the wall structure and obviously the physics of acoustics in order to really model what actually happens. Yeah. So with that, thinking of that, keeping that in mind, let's get back to this first question. So he basically says, my question is though, how do, if at all, do these room modes interact or bleed into each other when one wall or both walls, let's take the side walls, aren't just one straight surface, but there's a step in it, right? So let's say the front part is a certain distance away and then it kind of steps back into uh, a, a, a wider distance, right? And what happens to the room mode pattern when you have this kind of step in the surface? And the unfortunate answer is that it's basically really hard for me to give a concrete answer. It is because of what I just said for part two and also just the general shape of this step and the room itself, extremely hard to predict and say what actually happens. Yes, on a very fundamental level, the narrower section is going to give you a certain room mode at a certain frequency and the wider section is going to give you a certain room mode at a lower frequency because the distance is larger. How that step between those two actually happens is very hard to predict. First of all, before you actually put a microphone into the path of the sound field and to try and capture these room modes, they all just are superimposed on top of each other. They all happen at the same time. It's only when you start to actually sample <laughs> the sound pressure at a certain location in the room, in, the, in that space, do you actually combine all the energies of all those room modes at that spot and they will give you a single sound pressure value, for example. And yes, different room modes will interact at that point. So a, a, a positive pressure from one room mode might counteract a reduced pressure, a cancellation from another room mode. Yeah, this is why it's so difficult to analyze what happens in the room just by looking at the frequency response because it is just kind of like looking at the surface of the water, if you will. There's all this stuff happening below, but you're only pick taking a sample at the surface and you can't really tell how that exact level of the water, for example, or that exact sound pressure came about by the combination of all the stuff that happens below. So let's go back to understand, trying to narrow down or kind of approach how to understand this. One way would be to use a more complex room mode calculator, for example, like Audium Modal, which models the pressure distribution of complex room shapes at their boundaries. Yeah, if you want to 
if you want to have an idea of how this works, check out my video that I'm linking in the card right now. So that's where I showed you how this works. The one issue with this is that, again, it's only showing us the pressure distribution at the boundaries. It's not showing us what actually happens somewhere inside that space. Yeah, that's what makes this somewhat limiting. It's still quite interesting, though, though to get a sense of what happens. The next part of approaching this problem, understanding what's going on, is by answering this question, how far do I need to be so that I'm only being exposed to one room mode or and not two? So this is this is this is a, a, a an error in your thinking, unfortunately. You have to remember that even though you can break down the problem of the room modes down to individual modes from a scientific perspective, once you're in the room, you're always hearing all the room modes. There is no how far do I need to be to only be exposed to one and not two, because you're always exposed to all the room modes in the room. And obviously we have axial room modes in the room, which is what you're talking about, or specifically the, the first order room mode, uh, the first order axial mode, but you also have higher order axial modes. You can think of these like harmonics, higher up harmonics of the fundamental frequency. But then on top of that, we also have tangential and oblique modes. So these are room modes that get constructed, that kind of yeah, get, get built, reflecting off of more than just two parallel surfaces. And they have lower order and higher order uh, room modes or frequencies, if you will. Yeah, so you get this whole pack of room modes that are always present in the room. And no matter where you are, you will always hear all of them. Some of them might appear stronger at the location that you are sampling, aka where you're sitting with your, where your ears are located, and some might appear weaker, but they are always present, all of them. So the thing to take away here is that when you're thinking about this these kind of issues, these kind of problems, it, yes, it does make sense to try and break it down into these individual components to get a better understanding of what's going on, but you can't just leave it there. You always need to then put it back into the context of the entire sound field. And the reason that this is important is that an approach to dealing with a single component of the sound field might not make sense once you look at it in the bigger picture. I think that's one of the reasons why acoustics and approaching treating a room can be so um, so difficult and so confusing because a lot of the advice out there kind of dives down into single singular components of the sound field, tries to find a solution around that, but then doesn't step back out into the bigger picture and shows how that one step makes sense in the bigger context of the room. Yeah, for this is and this is a prime example. Yes, it makes sense to look at individual room modes to understand how they how they each work, but that doesn't tell you what how to approach the treatment of the room when you're once again in, in reality and you're faced with this onslaught of all these room modes, yeah? So when would it make sense to analyze the room mode pattern, for example, in a home studio scenario? Well, the first one would be to place your listening position, right? So w the position where you are located gives you a certain balance of the energy in all these different room modes. And if you want to make sure that you are starting off with a balanced low end, you got to make sure that you are located in a spot where they balance against each other. Uh, another reason why you might want to analyze the room modes when treating a home studio is to place resonance traps. So these are membrane traps, Helmholtz resonators, that sort of thing. Yeah. You might also think that it makes sense to analyze the room modes in order to place your standard porous absorber base traps. But in practice, this doesn't actually really make sense because these are not tuned devices. And so 
it makes way more sense to think of general surfaces to cover and just the surface area that you're covering when we're talking about porous absorber base traps. So already that reduces the importance or the usefulness of diving deep into the actual room mode pattern. You can do a much more superficial analysis of room modes and, and already get your answer. When we're talking about resonance traps, again, thinking big picture, treating a home studio, again, it doesn't really make sense to analyze the room mode pattern right at the start because from a treatment perspective, it doesn't make sense to use resonance traps generally in many cases. They are very costly. They use way more space than you'd think. And they're very, very finicky. They're very sensitive to placement. And those th three aspects combined make them far less useful in a home studio treatment approach than you might think. So it's much better to just do a lot, if not the majority, if not all of your treatment with porous absorption and potentially leave any treatment of specific individual problems to resonance traps all the way to the end, at which point you might find that it's not really possible to use them anymore, practically speaking. Yeah, so we've ruled out analyzing room modes for the purpose of placing porous absorber base traps. We've ruled out the usefulness of analyzing room modes, at least when you're starting out, for the purpose of placing resonance absorbers. So that leaves the, the, the usefulness of analyzing the room mode pattern in your room for the purpose of placing your listening position. And yes, at that point you can dive in, use audio modal and AMROC room mode calculator and whatever you want to use to, to calculate and simulate the room mode pattern. But that still won't tell you where <laughs> that spot is where the room modes balance out. And so Instead of going in and doing all this maths from a from a treatment perspective, it makes, makes way more sense to actually just go in the room and test the room mode pattern because that will actually tell you where the spot is, where these room modes balance out against each other. That's why I developed the Base Hunter technique, which again, you can download for free at the link in the description, right? This is a, a simple structured listening test that I developed in order to isolate the room mode problem and then do a step-by-step -step analysis of the actual pattern, room mode pattern in your ear with the distinct goal of figuring out where to place your listening position. Because that's all that matters. It doesn't matter to know exactly how the the interaction between these two individual room modes that are in the narrow step and the further step are. Unless you're doing a PhD in acoustics and you really want to do academic research, it's not useful to know that. It might be interesting, but it's not useful. And so you always have to ask yourself, am I doing this for the purpose of understanding or am I doing this for the purpose of actually treating my room? These are not necessarily the same thing. I think that's a very long-winded stream of consciousness answer to this question. What to take away here is it's actually very hard to understand some of these component, down to component level problems of the sound field in your room. And in many cases, it also just doesn't make any sense to even know what is going on because there are other ways to get to the result that you need that are much simpler and don't require you to get to the kind of the edge of where our knowledge is with acoustics these days. I hope that makes sense. I hope that helps you. I hope that answers your question, Lucas. With that, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.